Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your hosts for the second and final installment of Eurobuzz, Dr. Jeff Harrell and Dr. Ed Wilde. Good evening. Thank you and welcome once again. And thank you to the uh, introducer guy. I think he's awesome. I just love his voice. Oh, he's, he's got a real talent. I must find out who he is. Uh, I'm going to stop that because of the risk of uh, 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 epilepsy. Um, so welcome back. My name is Ed. And uh, this is, as I say, as the introducer said, the second and final night that we'll be presenting our digests of this, uh, the science that's been presented here for the benefit of everyone in the audience and everyone watching at home on the internet um, via HD Buzz. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Carroll. Uh, so, as some of you may not know, uh, we've been tweeting live throughout all the sessions. I'm sorry to tell you now after you missed the chance to hang out by the pool and keep up what was going on. Uh, but you can follow us tomorrow, if you like, at, H at HD BuzzFeed. Uh, we're also, at the end of each day, posting a digest. So if you see something and think, oh, that's cool, I want to tell my family about it, uh, yesterday's stories are already up on hdbuzz.net, uh, and tonight's will be done by the time you all finish drinking yourself silly at what sounds like a lot of drinking events. <clears throat> so, um, as those of you in the auditorium will have just heard, uh, this is the 10th anniversary of the European Huntington's Disease Network. Uh, but for the benefit of people who are not physically here but are watching at home, uh, I th we thought it would be cool to explore some of the things that that means. Uh, ten years of anything is a pretty good achievement, I guess. But um, what's so special about this network? What's the point of a network? What is the EuroHD network? So put simply, as, as simple as it needs to be for me to understand it, it's a network of professionals linked to family members whose, aim, whose shared aim is to try and improve the lives of people living with and living at risk of Huntington's disease. So the professional side is clinicians, so that's people involved in patient care, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, genetic counselors, and lots of other health professionals. There are also scientists, so people who work in labs and in other scientific settings doing research, but who don't necessarily interact directly with patients. So that's the core of the network, but it's also closely linked to the patient organizations from across Europe. And it's not just European either. The network has links with other networks across the world, like the Huntington Study Group and various new networks like the South American and the Chinese networks. And there are honorary members. So people, a lot of people who can contribute to meetings like this aren't necessarily from Europe, but they have stuff that Europeans need to hear about. And there are a lot of collaborations both within and beyond Europe. So what's been achieved in 10 years? That sounds awesome, but what's actually happened? So Jamie Levy very kindly supplied me with some numbers. We like numbers. So there are over 2,000 members, over 2,000 professionals involved in HD care and research in Europe, and that includes the honorary members as well. In 20 countries, the EuroHD network has established 159 study sites. Many of those are multidisciplinary clinics that care directly for patients, and the contributions of EuroHD network have been crucial for the setting up of those clinics. So that's a direct contribution to the care of HD patients and family members now. In addition, of course, to the fact that those are now 159 places where people can go to to take part in HD research, which is awesome. There's a seed funding scheme. So this is um, a, a way that the EuroHD network strategically donates money in the form of funding to scientists who want to do research that other people wouldn't fund. So HD is a relatively rare condition. But a small amount of money to generate what we call pilot data enables people to then set up a bigger project that, because the, the principle has been shown to work, can then get funding from a bigger organization. So, and that sounds cool, but what's that achieved? Well, 60 peer-reviewed publications have come from that seed funding scheme alone. The intangibles there are that it, the scheme I know for a fact as a member of, an outgoing member of the Scientific and Bioethics Advisory Committee, that that scheme has brought in researchers from other fields who would otherwise not be involved in Huntington's disease. And then the, the, the families do their work because once you meet HD family members, it's very difficult to leave HD research. So um, uh, bringing in researchers from outside the field to take part in research that's funded by EuroHD has made a big difference and has brought into the field lots of prominent researchers who would otherwise not be here. 
What about drug trials? Eight clinical trials have been supported uh, by the EuroHD infrastructure and expertise, and as we're about to hear, there are more on the way. It's an extremely exciting time. How many people have been touched by the EuroHD network? Well, it's very difficult to say, but uh, if we look just at a recruitment into the clinical studies that EHDN has conducted, over 13,000 family members have contributed to those research projects, principally registry and enroll HD. And again, many more will continue to contribute to the research in the future. And on, also on the research side, over 10,000 biological samples have been collected from HD family members. And those are really uh, critical to our research efforts. As I say, there are intangibles. So uh, the, 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 the uh, influence of the network stretches far beyond these numbers. And uh, you, know, you have, just have to take it from me, I guess, that uh, networks like this and similar networks, the global HD research community is one of the biggest assets that we have. And through working together and sharing our information and our expertise freely, it, it dramatically accelerates the research that's so crucial to families. So the, the, the point of all of this research, obviously, is to develop treatments that make a difference in the lives of Huntington's disease patients. And those of us that are from HD families or speak often with HD families and interact with them in their care will, will be familiar with the refrain of what's taking so long. Uh, the disappointment that often comes along with how tedious and slow the development of a drug can be. Um, and so Ed and I each day of this conference wanted to try to find a highlight, and today's highlight was, was really obvious, and I hope everyone will uh, agree with me that hearing about uh, not one, not two, not three, not four, but five new clinical trials happening or just starting uh, was certainly the highlight of the day. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they, we're just going to briefly mention them for the benefit of anyone who wasn't in that session. So the first trial that we want to mention is supported by Teva Pharmaceuticals. Um, and it concerns a drug called pridopidine, also known as Huntexil, and for those with long memories, also formerly known as ACR16. And this is a drug which has been tested in two clinical trials already, the heart study and the mermaid study. And in each of those trials, there was a suggestion that the drug was helpful for the movement problems of people with Huntington's disease. However, those trials were not conclusive on their own, enough to get the drug licensed. And so the uh, Pride HD study, which is already enrolling and is going to ramp up very rapidly across the world, in fact, um, is going to uh, involve larger numbers of people and higher doses of the drug to establish whether this drug uh, can uh, obtain a role uh, in the uh, movement problems of people with HD. Uh, Ralph Reilman joined us to talk about another, uh, another new trial, also uh, run in conjunction with the support of Teva Pharmaceuticals. Uh, designed to test whether a drug called laquinamod might be useful in Huntington's disease. Now, this is a drug that's already been tested in patients with multiple sclerosis, so we have a lot more uh, history about the drug safety uh, and potential adverse effects that might have happened and didn't from that, th uh, those trials, so that's really good news for moving quickly into trials with Huntington's. Um, this trial is not yet uh, recruiting, uh, but will be soon, uh, and uh, to see whether um, this drug, which is designed to block inf a process called inflammation, which is sort of the body's self-defense system, and we know that this defense system is sort of amped up in the brains of Huntington's disease patients. That's been seen. And so the question is whether this drug can dampen that down and therefore improve the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And we don't know that yet, but we soon will, thanks to the trial Legato HD. The third study we wanted to mention was a, a trial of deep brain stimulation, or DBS, so this, is, uh, this involves drilling tiny holes in the skull of just people. Just tiny ones. Just the minuscule holes in the head. And uh, inserting tiny electrodes very <laughs> carefully into the brain. Uh, and then uh, delivering tiny quantities of electricity to the brain. Um, All sounds very safe. It's, it is safe because, and we know this because it's actually reasonably widely used already in the field of Parkinson's disease, which is another movement disorder problem that, that causes brain degeneration and movement problems. Um, and a, a, it's a, a treatment that's increasingly being applied to other disease areas as well. So a Euro HD funded and supported trial, a, a small scale trial, has already shown some potential for this treatment for the movement problems that are seen in Huntington's disease, particularly the chorea, the unwanted movement. Now, uh, again, it's uh, de getting a, a Radical treatment like this demonstrated to be safe uh, is a big task, and so it was uh, very gratifying today to hear about the progress of this multi-center DBS trial, again supported by EuroHD. 
um, which uh, aims to look into this question more definitively and will also help hopefully give us an idea of which patients stand to benefit the most from this treatment. Uh, Christina Sampaio, the uh, Chief uh, Clinical Officer of the CHDI Foundation, joined us to talk about uh, not one but several trials being uh, planned or started to test uh, uh, drugs that block a little brain machine called phosphodiesterase 10 or PDE10. And the details are a bit complex even for neuroscientists, but the net effect of these drugs, at least in mice where it's been looked at in great detail, is that uh, communication between brain cells, which we know breaks down in the brains of people who have Huntington's disease, seems to be uh, helped. And uh, there are uh, two pharmaceutical companies, Omeros and Pfizer, who have drugs that block this PDE10 machine and that will be tested in Huntington's disease patients to see if this is beneficial. So there are not one but several trials starting or happening uh, to test PDE10 inhibitors in Huntington's patients. And the final trial that we wanted to cover, we we're actually going to make this subject of a special interview because uh, I think it, it's a trial that's been long awaited and it's a trial that deals really in, with Huntington, aims to deal with Huntington's disease in a very fundamental way because it's aiming to treat the, the known cause of the problem, which is the Huntington's disease gene and the mutant protein. Um, I, w I won't go into detail because I want the, the person we're going to interview to, uh, to go into it. The, the technique is known as Huntington lowering sometimes referred to as gene silencing, but we're kind of moving towards calling it Huntington lowering because it's slightly more precise. Um, she's my boss, so I'm going to keep completely silent. Yeah, right. If you can imagine such a thing. <laughs> uh, you may see my head explode or my ears bleeding <laughs> because I want to speak, but we'll try not to. So uh, please welcome my boss and Huntington's disease researcher from University College London, Professor Sarah Tabrizi. I have to start by saying that no one can be your boss, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, You're thank unbossable, <laughs> but in, in a good way. <laughs> so thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is super cool news, um, but we, we haven't shared any details with the folks at home. So what is this trial, this first trial of Huntington lowering? What is it, what is it structured to do? So this is a first into human study of a molecule or a drug therapy that is looking to try and lower Huntington. And it's a DNA-like molecule that binds to the Huntington message and lowers then the Huntington protein. Okay, so we have, the, we have the Huntington gene that everyone has a mutated copy who will develop Huntington's disease. There's this intermediate message step, and then there's the Huntington protein, which we think is the bad guy. And this drug uh, blocks that middle step, the message. It does. Okay, and so what, what are the drugs called? What type of drugs are they? It's an antisense oligonucleotide. Antisense oligonucleotide. ASO. And the name of the drug is ASO Huntington RX. Snappy. Uh, so, uh, so one of the reasons we wanted to discuss with this with you is that unlike some of the other drugs that are being um, tested, which are more traditional kind of molecules you take as a pill, um, those of us who study these things know that ASOs, as these, um, these large DNA molecules, are a little more difficult to get where they need to be. So what's the plan for delivery? So this drug is going to be delivered via lumbar puncture. Okay. And so this is what we call intrathecal delivery. And so it's a, a, a lumbar puncture into the lower spinal cord. So that sounds like a big deal. Uh, is Actually, it's not into the lower spinal cord. It's into the lower lumbar, lumbar region. Just where there's fluid space. Where the space. lumbar spinal cord ends, where there's a fluid space. Yeah. Okay, so even if there's no spinal cord there, that still seems like kind of a big deal. Is this a routine procedure or is it something we should be worried about? So this is um, uh, very commonly used in oncology, in cancer therapy. So for over 20 years, they've been giving... Uh, via a lumbar puncture, and what's it's called, intrathecal, delivery of agents to treat cancer. Okay. And so in oncology, intrathecal delivery is routine. And there are many years of established guidelines for intrathecal delivery of substances. It's also used commonly, and many of you who've had children have had an epidural, and an epidural is a delivery of anesthetic into the lumbar region to numb the area. And so in anesthetics, in pain relief, 
and in many other neurological diseases and in oncology, it's a very common form of administration. So many years of experience with this form of administration. So childbirth or cancer or other diseases like that? <laughs> you are in so much trouble with your I, wife. I'm not the physician of the team, so I'm approximating. <laughs> Uh, are, are treated, you know, acutely, you get a tumor, you try to get better, you have a baby, you stop, hopefully. Um, so, but what about Huntington's? This is a chronic disease. So are we going to have to get lumbar punctures every day? What's going to happen? It's a good question. So the way the ASO works is that it lasts for about four months. Mm. Its onset to lower Huntington is about four to six weeks, and then it lasts for about four months. And at the moment, the delivery is going to be every month. Mm. It's a single dose at monthly intervals and it's just purely looking at safety mm. and uh, the interval at the moment is once per month and it may be that that interval changes but it's only a rare dosing right, so or not, a, 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 not, not every day. So uh, you said this is a safety trial first and foremost um, obviously with something this experimental that's important but what would be the next steps if, if this first trial is successful? So I want, and it's important to emphasize this, that this trial is about safety. Hmm. It's a first into human safety study. And many different uh, steps are being taken to ensure that this is a very safe study and we're going to look at safety and tolerability. Hmm. We're going to be looking at some potential measures or endpoints. And uh, we know from animal model work that uh, switching, or switching off or lowering Huntington for a period of time is highly beneficial. And so if this study we show that this is safe and tolerated, then the next phase will be to go into what's called a phase two and then a phase three, which is to look at how effective this drug is at treating Huntington's disease. Right. And then when that, we know that, if that works, then in the future, and I, as in my uh, talk yesterday, in the future, if it reaches phase two and phase three, then it might be that we're able to then give it to people who carry the gene but who are completely well. That's, try to do disease prevention. But this is the beginning of a path along that way. And um, the study, Roche is partnering with ISIS to take it forward if it's promising and safe and tolerated to a phase two and a phase three. That's, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for joining us. Please thank you. I nearly did stay quiet. Um, if you want to find out more about Huntington lowering or Huntington gene silencing, um, we've written tons of articles about it because we thought it's cool for quite a while. Uh, the, the best place to start is article number 23 on HD Buzz. Um, so check that out if you are interested. So um, we're nearly done, but it, we've, dis we've discussed that this is the 10th anniversary of EuroHD Network, and the people who are watching at home won't know that Bernard Lanvermeyer, the Professor Lanvermeyer, esteemed uh, senior neurologist and extremely respected clinician and HD researcher, uh, it's stepping down as the head of the EuroHD network after 10 years. It was his idea, and he's been very much the driving force behind this remarkable network for these 10 years. And so we wanted to pay our own personal EuroBuzz, HD Buzz, Jeff and Ed tribute to Bernard in the only way we know uh, how, which is through humiliation. Please welcome him to the stage, Professor Bernard Lambermeyer. So, Bernie, you, you, don't, you, you don't mind if I call you Bernie. I want to give you a big hug now. Oh, so sweet. Because I love you dearly, uh, and because I won't want to hug you in a moment. Um, actually, so I just we got yeah we got time. Uh, in 2006, I had a phone call to my mobile from an unknown number in Germany, and, and a man said, uh, "My name is Bernard Landvermeier, and I want to invite you to a workshop." about biomarkers for Huntington's disease. And I think it was like my second week in the, no, it was 2005, my second week in the job. Uh, and I said, oh, that sounds good. I'd like to go to Paris, um, but I don't know who you are. <laughs> it's 
story of my scientific career. Uh, <laughs> so I phoned Sarah Tabrizi and said, a man called Bernard just rang me and said, do I want to go to Paris with him? Um, <laughs> do you think it's okay? <laughs> and she said, that's Professor Landvermeyer. He's very senior and very important, and of course you must go to... Oh, I'm doing the voice. Um, <laughs> Um, of course you must go. Anyway, and, and that was the start of a beautiful uh, friendship, which is about to end. Uh, so, Bernard, I want to ask you if you are familiar with the phrase ice bucket challenge. <laughs> it's, we're not going to make Bernard do the ice bucket challenge. It's much worse than that. Uh, let me show you a video and then you'll know what I'm talking about. Oh! There we go. I forgot, to, <laughs> I forgot to do the Bernard slide. Okay, so uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge. This is Donatella Versace experiencing the Ice Bucket Challenge, raising awareness for ALS or motor neuron disease. Why'd you pick this video, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the first one that came to mind. There we go. Um, so people get a bucket of water tipped over their heads and it raises awareness and funds, and it's been hugely successful in mm -hmm. doing that. So there's a movement in the Huntington's disease community, some of you may have heard of, called the Pie in the Face Challenge. <laughs> Uh, how, give us a cheer if you've done the pie in the face challenge. Yay! So that it's, uh, it's got, it began in the US and is certainly gathering momentum. The HDO folks have been doing it on Facebook, uh, and we don't like to be left behind. This is Matt Ellison uh, receiving, for some reason, two pies <laughs> in the face. From, from it must be said, uh, his brand new wife. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, so there we go. That's the sort of thing that, 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 that happens, and it's the hashtag pie in the face for HD is how you track this thing online. So um, I won't so much ask you whether you want to do it as uh, sort of instruct you to stand there while my accomplice Dr. Yuri Silvestov from Moscow presents today's Barcelona fact of the day. This is the Hesperia Hotel's finest crema catalana, which is as close as, close as it gets to a pie in these parts. Um, you have the choice, we're going to demic you, and then you have the choice of whether you wish to go the, the au naturel or whether you want a towel over your shoulders. And I'm going to give the honour to my esteemed friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Carroll. Oh, me? Yeah. Hang on, this is going to be good. Because I still need to be able to work in Europe after this. I'm going to step down. We're going to probably endanger the lives of the flamenco dancers who are to follow. Uh, there's really no pretty way to do this, Bernard. Yeah, that's the idea. You might have to... Do so, we need a can we, yeah. if you want to come and video it, run to the front now with yeah. your smartphones. Oh, uh, there we go. I, th I'm I think record. the only way is... Uh, wait, 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 wait. Not yet, not yet, Does not yet. Does anyone want to come yet, video? Keep clapping, keep clapping. And we'll do a countdown. No. Are we ready? Right. What? You're going to count down. Ten. Oh, nine. God. Eight. <laughs> seven. Six. Five, four, three, two, one. Pie in the face! <laughs> Get that man a towel. Mm, come here. <laughs> delicious. <laughs> I recommend it. Um, so, at this point, Jeff thinks we're done. <laughs> at this point, Jeff thinks we're good, done, good. but um, I've done the challenge and Bernard's done the challenge and there's someone else on the stage who has not yet done the challenge. And Yuri brought a spare pie and you've taken your jacket off. May I suggest that you take your microphone on. No, I don't think I will. I think I'll keep well, it Well, then on. you have to pay for the microphone, because this is not optional. Oh, God. Would you like uh, to do it, Bernard? Go ahead. I'll do it. <laughs> Long time in the, in the desire. Okay. Uh, you ready? No. I, I think we need another countdown from ten. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pie in the face! <laughs> Mm. Mm. It really is lovely. Okay. 
Well, there we go. That was much more involved. And that, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how Huntington's disease research works. <laughs> um, so I think we're probably done here. Um, we'll help clean up the stage. Uh, you guys have a great evening. We've been Jeff and Ed. We love Professor Lambermeyer. We love your OHD. And thank you. Good night. Good night.